There are 7.4 billion people who live in the world today, and about half of us live in cities. By the year 2050, population will increase to 9.7 billion, and about two-thirds of us are going to live in cities. As a result, we must go out and construct buildings to accommodate 2.7 billion more people in our cities in just over the next three decades. And while this is a massive challenge to go out and take on, it is not this challenge that concerns me most. Right now, real estate development is being played almost exclusively, exclusively as a finance game, where developers try to deliver the most product, buildings, at the lowest, lowest cost to the greatest number of people, because this is how they make the most money. And when they're working with their, <coughs> this equation, trying to maximize their profit, there are elements that are outside of their control. One is that land, we can't create more of it in our cities, so it's becoming more scarce and more expensive. On top of that, it just doesn't seem like it's as cool to be a tradesperson as it once was. Not for people my age and younger. We don't seem to want to work with our hands. And this is a problem because we really do not have enough skilled tradespeople to go out and build all of these buildings. So what is in a developer's control? Well, they can choose really simplistic or really cheap building materials, which they do, and they can choose really simplistic building methodologies that reduce the amount of on-site labor to build these buildings, which they do. And the result is that for the past few decades, our cities have been blanketed with these sterile boxes, many of which are not that well built and will have to be rebuilt in the coming decades. So some people might consider me a bit of an environmentalist. I like to think that I'm not quite so idealistic. I have a company that designs, builds, and develops real estate with the goal of connecting people to nature and creating amazing community in urban environments. So it'd be pretty natural for me to stand on a stage today and paint this picture of a more utopic future. But I think that there's already a lot of people who have done that, and we're not getting the results that we need. So I want to ask a different question. What if? What if we knew the equation for developing sustainable cities? I think that there is one. I'm going to show it. But in this, there are elements of this equation that are controversial as well, and some people may be willing to accept or not to accept. But by talking about them, maybe we can find a solution for creating more sustainable cities in the future. So I said before that I like to think that I'm not such an idealistic person. I really think that idealism has rarely succeeded as a true change agent in the world. It's kind of like creativity without constraint. It's just chaos. So for me, when I look for the things that really do drive change, I look for the common denominators. And what I typically see is money and profit. So therefore, I state, sustainable development must be driven by profit. So we're here today in this very beautiful place, Aruba. And it's an amazing place because, as I know, it's going to be 100% renewable by 2020. And it's not just blind idealism that's driving this. Right now, they have to import diesel fuel to the island to power the electricity plants, and this is an extremely expensive way to generate electricity. So when they found a way to bring in solar and wind power contractors to develop renewable energy, they opened their arms, they connected the dots, and made it happen. They've been able to find out a solution that is both environmentally and financially sustainable here. And it's amazing because there's so many other places in the world that have similar circumstances, but will not see these results. So earlier this year, uh, my firm received an award for Project of the Year from the United States Green Building Council, and it's for a project that we designed, built, and developed in Portland, Oregon. But there's something that very few people know about this project. Four and a half years ago, uh, when it was just an idea, I was just a subcontractor, and I didn't have very much money, and I hadn't been building buildings, which is a really terrible recipe for trying to get a bank loan. So for many months, as I was trying to develop this project, I was told no, time after time. But eventually, somebody at the city of Portland saw my vision for this building, and they decided to help me out. They found a way to give me a quarter million dollars of taxpayer money. I would have to pay it back, but they would allow me to include it as equity, where they would take a second position on the loan behind the primary lender. 
And this gave me the resources that I needed to go out and build it. The project features thousands of plants growing out of the walls. On the street, you'll find awnings that are made out of solar panels. And when we looked at the cost of them and then took out five years of energy production as well as some of the incentives for installing solar panels, we found out that they would actually cost us less than fabric or glass awnings. So I always wondered why nobody else was doing them. In the, in the courtyard, you'll find a cistern where we capture rainwater so we don't have to pay the city to water all of the plants. And if you look at this building, it's really just a series of similar decisions where we took the things that we had to do or we knew that we wanted to do, and we just found ways to use environmental technology to do so. So after a year, when there was people actually living in the building, we wanted to go back and see if these decisions really made sense. And this is what we found. This building achieved LEED Platinum certification, which is the highest level of LEED certification. And the energy model that we had for this, we beat it by 26% for electricity and 28% for water. These units are using 65% less water than average units and 53.4% less electricity. So they really are reducing the impact that these people have on the environment. The project was completed in February of 2015. The financial gain was 55%. The operating expenses were 21.08%. And this is really critical because in a financial climate like we have in the world today, if you can save a dollar operating a, a building, you can generally add about $20 to its value because the interest rates are low. The return on investment for the sustainable parts of the construction was 172%. And I share this today because so many of my most favorite architects in the world have shown buildings that are so beautiful and so sustainable. But when people find out how much they cost, they say they can't build them. But I believe that if you take a pragmatic approach to how you design buildings, sustainable buildings, that you can create buildings that are also financially sustainable. So we're taking the things that we've learned from this building and we're building other buildings now. Here is one that's inspired by Antelope Canyon in Arizona. We took the hallways that we would normally use to just bring people to their units, and we created outdoor ones where we wouldn't have to heat or cool them, but we've created a space that's beautiful and where people can meet each other. Here's a project that's inspired by a grove of birch trees, and when it rains, water will cascade down through the courtyard and collect in a cistern in the retail, retail space down below. This project was inspired by a set of rolling hills because it sits on a bluff overlooking downtown Seattle. We knew we wanted to connect people to nature and give them views of the city, and we're just using our environmental technology, our living wall system, to do this. So these are our examples of a pragmatic approach to sustainable design. This is the first element of my equation that we must have pragmatic, not idealistic, sustainable design. So I asked this question, is sustainability the new insert polarizing topic here? It really seems that sustainability and climate change has become a political issue and not a human one. In the United States, 97% of all scientists agree that humans are having some sort of an effect on climate change, whereas only 41% of the American public does. And so at my firm, we wanted to see, does this actually matter? Is this preventing people from going out and building sustainable buildings? So we contacted the United States Green Building Council, and with their data, compiled a list of the top 10 cities that are building the most sustainable projects, LEED certified projects, per capita. We then went and looked at the past 20 years to see which political party was ruling these cities. And what we found was that 99% of all years in the past 20 for the top 10 cities were ruled by one political party, and only 1%, only two years, was by the other. And I show this today not to say one party is better than the other, absolutely not, only that I think politics does matter. And so for this reason, I really believe that it's critical that we stop polarizing people with political issues if arguing about climate change is actually preventing us from achieving our goals, then we're not getting where we really want to go, are we? So this is the second part of my equation. We must eliminate policy that polarizes people because it only prevents us from achieving our goals. 
Well, I said before I like to look for common denominators, and I really believe that this is one. Nobody wants to live in this city. We've raised over $50 million in the past couple of years to develop, to develop our projects, and much of it has come from overseas investors. And what we're finding is that while we think they like our projects, one of the number one reasons why people are coming and investing in the United States is to purchase visas so that they can move themselves and their families. It's no longer healthy for them to live where they live. They don't want to put a mask on when they go for a run or to walk their children down the street. But these are the realities that face many cities all over the world that have had too much development without any attention paid to how sustainable it was. And I find it a bit ironic that we're actually incentivizing people to come to the United States and do the very thing in our country that has caused them to want to leave ours, or theirs. So I do believe that the government does, has a role. So for most developers, when you have an idea for a project, you have three years where you basically are in the higher risk phase. You've got to go out, build it, get it rented up, or sell it. And then once it's done, basically you can get lower rate interest to hold on to it. But what happens here is that developers make bad decisions, I think, because they're so focused on what the building is going to be worth in year three. They can't look long term. And so when they do finish a building, generally the bank will give them about 70% of their interest back, or their, the money back. If it's worth 10 million, they can pull out $7 million, and that will leave them with about $3 million of value left in it. This money that they're able to refinance after the project is done is generally not enough to pay back the investors and the higher rate of interest that they owe them. And so what happens is that we start thinking short term as developers and start, instead of thinking long term. But sustainability is about thinking long term. So we need to potentially put together some sort of way that people who go out and take on the extra expense to build a better building to reward them for that. So maybe this is a solution where we could take 20% and allow them to pull out more equity. This would allow them to hold on to the building, because if they just sell it in three years, but something takes five or 10 years to pay it back, then it doesn't really make financial sense for them. And this is the third part of my equation. If we want long-term decision-making, we must have access to long-term capital. The fourth part is pretty simple. We already know that we have to welcome 2.7 billion more people into our cities in just over the next three decades. We also know that it does cost more to build a really sustainable project than an average one, probably at least 8 to 10 percent. And so this is a way to not use any taxpayer money to incentivize developers or give them a reward for building a better building. So they would be able to get, if they went lead gold, one extra floor beyond what the zoning code would allow two for lead platinum, and three floors if they pursued something as ambitious as the living building challenge. I think that this would really, this part alone would drive a huge amount of sustainable development around the world wherever it was offered. And this is the fourth part to my equation, that density incentives would make a big difference. So I truly believe that we must have pragmatic, not idealistic design. We must eliminate issues, policies, that separate us because they only prevent us from achieving our goals. We must have access to long-term capital so that we can make long-term decisions. And we must incentivize developers to build better buildings. With these four things, I really believe that we could go out and develop the types of cities that we all want to live in the world. The types of cities that are healthy, that are community-oriented, and that are truly sustainable. Thank you.